hello everybody. It's very nice to have you all here and I hope that I'm going to leave you with a little bit more information about uh, the important role that American Indians have paid it, played in our past, in our present, in our future, uh, in our culture, and in our communities. And I hope that you'll leave with a little bit of a spark of curiosity and interest and um, perhaps commit yourself to learning even more about this important part of our, of our country and our past. I put up the Pledge of Allegiance because it struck me how incomplete the language is in our Pledge of Allegiance, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Our nation has never been just one nation. From the very beginning, establishment of this country, there have been additional, additional nations part of our country and our community. There are Indian nations that, of course, were here um, before Europeans and are still here despite a tremendous path of travail and challenge uh, from the beginning. I think it's important for people to know that when this country was discovered by Christopher Columbus, um, there were, it was not an empty land. There were over 10 million people here uh, at that time. And they'd been here for more than 10,000 years. And this is a fact that really doesn't resonate um, with people. I think it's, it's, it's an uncommon way to think about American Indians in the past. And I use the term American Indians because the term Indians is, is, is part of our, our constitution, it's part of our statutory law, it's the common terminology um, with reference to this part of our community. An important thing to know, I, I believe, is that at the time of discovery, um, these cultures were diverse in themselves and uh, this 10 million people um, comprised many, many tribes and bands and groups that were healthy and strong and effective and efficient. And they were farmers and they were foresters and fisher people and nomads. And there was a tremendous network of uh, trade routes and, and trade activity among those people. They also had their own internal governmental structures. And that's an important fact to know and to remember. But then came incredible tragedy. Shortly after um, Europeans began to make inroads in this continent, began a tremendous uh, era of death. And it was not death from warfare. It was death from disease. Uh, I'm sure that we all know that uh, many Indians died because of disease, but I had no idea that the population was, was reduced by 90% in the period of 100 years because of bubonic plague, smallpox, influenza, measles, and similar diseases. Um, so when the explorers arrived here um, and, sh and within 100 years thereafter. That 10 million people that were here originally was reduced to something less than 2 million. One reason I think that's important is because many historians believe, and it seems logical to me, that had the indigenous population remained at its numbers, remained healthy and strong, it's very, very unlikely that exploration and settlement of this country would have occurred in anything like the way it did. So those early years were um, largely involved with conflicts between um, settlers and explorers and Indians, and that resulted in the creation of treaties. 
you've all heard about treaties and you have a general idea of what they are, but I want you to understand an important point, and that is that they are political contracts between sovereign nations. And the concept of sovereignty is critical to what I, I'm hoping you'll remember from today. And sovereignty is simply the, the right and power to make laws for a distinct group of people and have that group of people governed by those laws. And that sovereignty for Indian nations predates any European involvement. And it's generally called inherent sovereignty. And what that means is the power of Indian nations to be sovereign and to govern themselves um, was not granted to them by the United States or by any other entity. They had it, they have it still. It's also important to remember, I think, that treaties were not intended to be one-sided. They were intended to be bargains. And leaving aside all of the issues about language and lack of understanding and lack of representation and many other aspects of treaty making that present difficult moral, ethical, and legal issues, they were intended to be um, uh, contracts under e which each party got something and gave something. The British and the French were here before uh, um, the United States existed. And of course, they also entered into treaties with Indian nations. And particularly, particularly the British took the position that these were sovereign nations and treated them accordingly. In other words, the underlying framework of treaty making was not about conquered nations. It was about peacemaking. It was about exchanging um, benefits. The British and then the US wanted safe passage for their troops and, and then later on for settlers. Um, and they wanted land. The tribes wanted peace. They wanted protection um, from the encroachment of settlers. And they wanted protection for their resources, their land, their forests, their natural resources. I think it's interesting to know that the modern term reservations came right out of this treaty making um, framework because tribes reserved to themselves certain lands and certain rights and powers. And like states, the idea and the legal consequence was that anything that was not granted to the United States uh, in these treaties remained the rights and powers of the sovereign tribal nations. The United States Constitution is, of course, an important and seminal document. And one of the interesting things uh, that's in our Constitution is that Congress was given the specific authority to regulate commerce, commerce is the broad term, and it meant all actions, interactions, with the Indian tribes. The president, of course, had treaty-making authority with the consent of the Senate. The effect of these constitutional provisions was to assert and to effect the principle that even though tribal nations are sovereign, that sovereignty is subject to the federal government, and it still is. Even more interesting to me um, uh, with regard to the Constitution is that we would not have the Constitution we have today if it had not been for the Iroquois Confederacy. When people uh, began settling in this country, there was a group of Indian nations in the Northeast called the Iroquois Confederacy a group of five and then six um, tribes that had come together uh, over the centuries and created the first and oldest and still existing uh, democracy in the world. Remember that the world, as we look at it in retrospect, 
was not based on democracy. It was based on monarchies and the power of conquest. But the Iroquois Confederacy built its uh, principles around the idea of the unity of mutual interests. They were six, five, and then six distinct tribes, all with individual interests, but they had a much larger overarching interest that would be served by their unification. They also had, as the principles of their great law, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, of voting, and separation of powers, and representative government. And um, in 1744, there was a, a summit in New York, I think it was, where colonial leaders came and the sachems of the, Confe uh, the Iroquois, Iroquois Confederacy came and they had a long discussion about ideas of government, the Iroquois being uh, translated because Many of them did not speak English, and of course, none of the colonists spoke their languages. So they had uh, an important translator. And the um, summit focused around these ideas, the idea of unification. The Iroquois Confederacy was recommending to the colonists that they figure out how to come together into a, a unified group. And uh, the transcript of this summit was um, prepared by the, by the translator, who happened to be a friend of Benjamin Franklin's. And he sent this transcript to Benjamin Franklin, who had a printing press. And um, Benjamin Franklin began disseminating these ideas among the colonies. And ultimately, Franklin and George Washington were advocates at the various discussions of uh, constitutional development of incorporating these very ideas into our Constitution. I think we owe them a tremendous debt of gratitude because a lot of our concepts of, uh, within the Bill of Rights came directly from the Iroquois Confederacy. So you're all familiar with the huge expansion of uh, immigrants and settlers into this country from the early 1700s well into the 1900s. But by 1800, um, it was clear to the federal government that the US needed more land for settlers. And at that time, there were a number of Indian reservations uh, or Indian communities uh, that were recognized in the eastern part of the United States, but that land was too, too much of a, a value and too necessary. And the US then in the mid, uh, early 1800s began forcing the eastern tribes to move west of the Mississippi. Um, and that policy was formally um, enshrined in statute with the Indian Removal Act in 1830, uh, which carried forward the concept that the federal government could trade unsettled lands west of the Mississippi for the homelands of Indian people. Um, this was not without controversy or resistance by the Indian people, I can assure you. This all was taking place in the context of the policy of assimilation. The idea of assimilation was, um, in a, the governmental thinking, that eventually um, all American Indians would become just like everybody else. And the way they felt that that would best be made to happen was to eliminate Indian culture. And so the movement of uh, Indian nations to um, reservations was done in this context. So reservations were originally intended by the United States to be sort of stopovers uh, on the way to eliminating not only the reservations themselves, but eliminating the United States trust responsibility to American Indians. So they needed surplus lands. And how did they decide to create surplus lands? The 
1887 Dawes Act accomplished that for the United States. And what the Dawes Act did, it's also called the Allotment Act, is keep, uh, is assign individual Indians to plots of land and allow all of the other surplus land to be homesteaded. And this whole policy ended up reducing Indian lands by about 90%. I mentioned the trust responsibility uh, of the United States. And um, I want you to realize that this is a responsibility that the United States took upon itself. It created that responsibility for itself, and that, that responsibility remains. There's a unique political relationship between the United, the United States and tribal sovereign nations. And that unique historic relationship of government to government is what permits and requires special treatment and special support for Indians. They're not considered to be a racial or ethnic group. They're a political group. And government to government relationships uh, are the foundation. The reform era, era of the mid 1920s is important to know. In 1924, the Merriam Report disclosed the incredible and total failure of prior policies. FDR, in the New Deal era, developed a, a, the Indian Reorganization Act, which was the beginning of the very important development of where we are today. And Johnson and, Nix and Nixon both played an important role in moving us to the self-determination era. Self-determination is what all Indian nations want to have protected. The right guaranteed to them through their inherent sovereignty to make and be governed by their own laws under their own um, decisions and cultures. We've got now about 2 million Americans, Indian, American Indians in the United States, just about the same number that uh, were in place at the time. And we are now in an, era, in an era of nation building. I think there's more opportunity, more possibility for American Indians today to begin to realize their full potential and to become successful and protected in the same way that all American citizens are. Indians didn't become American citizens officially until 1924. Now they have triple citizenship, and they are an important part of our, of our communities and our state. We've got about 6.5% uh, population of American Indians in Montana. And Montana has the only constitutional provision in any state which recognizes the um, importance of American Indian culture and tradition and has made it a part of our statutory requirements to provide Indian education for all. I hope that you'll follow up with some reading. And I, of course, will answer any questions when I have the opportunity. And uh, thank you very much for your time. <laughs>